two big, really big ones, which actually reflects what we saw in this room, are many worlds and none of the above, mm. slash undecided. I think you should separate those out next time. None of the above and undecided. Yeah. Because none of the above means you have some other idea that right. isn't listed, and undecided means you're not sure. So okay. Those are to totally different things. So it's, so, so it's definitely interesting that the, the landscape is much more wide open, people are more willing to consider crazy sounding ideas. I don't understand At the same time, that. it's also very clear that there is no, that uh, this is a very active area. Zero. Question mark. Question mark. And the first question, question, why nobody, was there a There was not a single person who said uh, yes here. Oh, and you just didn't bother counting the other no, Exactly. Okay. So why should you care about this, other than that it's, you know, fun to annoy our friends with it and so on? Well, uh, I'll tell you a little bit, let me just tell you a bit what I, why I care about it, uh, and why a lot of the early thinkers about this, like Schrodinger himself, were kind of disturbed. Textbook quantum mechanics, the way we, we all teach it in the classroom, basically, that has these two postulates. The first one saying that all isolated systems evolved according to the Schrodinger equation, and the second one saying that, well, when you look at something, then it no longer evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, and it evolves in some random way, called the wave function collapse, and there are rules for the probability. And these, this means that the, the, te the textbook quantum mechanics we teach is either inconsistent, or is just unable to make predictions for certain experiments, which then makes it incomplete. Because right? you know, if you have some system and it's doing its thing, if you look at the whole universe, for example, either it's obeying the Schrodinger equation or it isn't. And um, if I'm making an observation and the wave function collapses, if Anthony just decides to view the whole universe as the system, it's not being observed from outside. So, but can't I observe it? Huh? So I'm taking myself out of the system by observing. It. So if it's if it's an if it's an isolated system, would you we are, if it's a different universe, suppose it's a, a parallel universe where um, somewhere we you know we have absolutely no causal contact with, and you're just mm -hmm. thinking about what's happening. The only way to avoid the inconsistency, which, and this isn't anything I've contributed, or in, this is this goes of course way back to Niels Bohr and others is to say that there are just some questions like that you just shouldn't ask, and that's because the theory can't answer them. And that, so you then have to down the scope of quantum mechanics. This is goals in saying it's not supposed to be a fundamental theory. It's just some kind of approximation which you can use in some, some cases. And, and that worked really well for, for many, many years. And when quantum mechanics was only important experimentally for very tiny stuff. Before I sit down, though, I wanted to just take a few minutes also Tell you about one more fun little twist on this, which I, which, from which is this thing Anthony and I realized, which I, is actually kind of a new twist. And uh, I'll preface it by saying this: even though people argued about this in 1925, and people argue about it now, there has been some progress made. When, and in particular, progress has come from progress in other fields, which has altered the whole context of the discussion of quantum mechanics. First of all, there is experimental progress. Uh, it seemed like just pure philosophy for its own sake to argue about these things for a long time, when the only experiments you could make where you demonstrated quantum behavior were with individual atoms. But that's completely changed. People like Anton Zeilinger are doing quantum, demonstrating quantum behavior in really large objects now. We're funding the styrofoam balls and viruses. We're funding the styrofoam <laughs> balls and virus interference. Keith Schwab got an FQX grant to take a little micro-mechanical cantilever, a piece of metal with like 10 to 14 atoms and put it in two places at once. So, so, the, so that's a big change, which has really forced people to take seriously what, uh, this question of what happens really with quantum mechanics for large things. If you can make experiment, we can't just do what Niels Bohr said, and say you're not allowed to ask that question. A second thing which has changed is the discovery of decoherence, which I'm not going to talk about at all now, but it was discovered in 1970 by Hans Dietrich Say and, and Wojtek Zurich, the reactor in FQX has been a big pioneer, and it's basically the discovery of this effect which you can just derive mathematically from the Schrodinger equation, which is a kind of censorship effect. 
which explains why we don't, we shouldn't expect to see quantum weirdness for large things, even if it's there. Basically, the result is that whenever something interacts with its environment, the quantum weirdness gets hidden. So those are two important discoveries, which are really, I think, made the whole debate more nuanced. Well, Anthony and I think that there's, a th there's a third discovery too, which is very relevant for quantum mechanics, and it's the stuff which Andre talked about, and which Raphael mentioned, which is progress in cosmology. Cosmology used to be a totally flaky subject, and now we have all these measurements, and we begin to have much more confidence that we know a bit about what's going on on the larger scales. And in particular, Andre and others have told us that there's a real possibility that space itself isn't just really big but there's actually infinite. Okay. We don't know that for a fact, but let's suppose for a moment that Andre is right, and space really is infinite. Suppose we had eternal inflation that produced an infinite space with, with, with all sorts of, with random seed fluctuations laid down slightly differently in all the different places. What does that really mean? I'm going to argue that that actually has pretty radical implications for, for quantum mechanics for the interpretation of quantum mechanics, which seems like it has, we have nothing to do with it. So, just very, very briefly, suppose, suppose Bruce McWilliams has a stern Gerlach apparatus, okay? He has an electron, it has, has a silver atom with a spin, and in some direction, and you can describe it by this wave function. He sends it through the apparatus, which can actually come from here, and because of the magnetic field gradient, It'll end up either up here if it's spin up in this direction, or there if it's spin down. This is the measurement he's going to make here on the planet where he lives. That's the way we used to think about it. Here is one planet, one Bruce, one experiment. Let's figure out what happens. But what Andre is really telling us is that that's not the correct way to look at it. We have this infinite space with infinitely many planets. And no matter how unlikely it is that there will be a Bruce on a planet, doing this experiment, the probability wasn't zero, because it happened here. So there'll be infinitely many other planets where Bruce is also just gearing up to do that experiment. So again, it's, the assumption may sound crazy, and, you, and you, um, if we don't need, you don't need to buy into the assumption, but let's just ask what that assumption logically leads to. Suppose it is this way, that we have this infinite space, and there, there's a Bruce McWilliams living here, the Google Plex light years away, Bruce is, there's another identical Bruce here doing the experiment, and one there. Now what? Well, we can still analyze this with just standard quantum mechanics and see what happens. We can write down the, the joint wave function now for these three silver atoms. So there are, are two times two times two, eight different possibilities, right? You have either all three of them can come out down, or all three of them can come out up, and then there are these other ones. And I, so I can write down the total wave function for the whole thing is the thing having eight components, the amplitudes for each of these. And I can work out what's going to happen. And there's been a lot of recent interest in this kind of questions, because Don Page pointed out that to get the right answer for this standard quantum mechanics, it's not enough anymore to just use the standard quantum, standard quantum rule for, for the probabilities. You, you all, because if, if you, for example, conclude that there's some probability you're going to end up with this situation. Two planets get spin down and one of them gets spin up. That still doesn't tell us what for sure Bruce is going to see, right? Because he doesn't know which of the three planets he's on. So to get the right answer, you also need to introduce some classical probability, just the way Laplace did for playing cards back in the, back in the day, where, where Bruce would say, well, there are three it could be this here, or it could be on that planet or that, I don't know which. It's all just symmetric, so I'm going to say it's one third for each. So you put in this little classical factor, weight each thing by how many, the number's the right. And then you sum it all up and you get the right answer.